Uh, it's titled Tales from the Cryptograms. Yes. Sex, Death, and Alternative Lifestyles from the Kingdom Fungi. And with that, here's a quote. From morphology to reproductive strategies, from nutritional modes to interdigitations with human culture, this will be a multidisciplinary exploration of fungal strangeness. So a little bit just about Christian. Uh, Christian has been seriously interested in fungi since he was a high school in San Diego. The long, dry summers there didn't suit his lifestyle. So he emigrated to Santa Cruz, the land of milk, caps, and honey, mushrooms. His travels so far have taken him all over the United States, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Europe. He is currently in the midst of authoring Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, a fully illustrated field guide to mushrooms of California. Building a website, also building a website database to document the microflora of Santa Cruz County and writing for his blog, Notes of a Microfile. Mushrooms arouse his curiosity with their sundry forms from the grotesque to the bizarre to the sublime. Taxonom taxonomically, he's interested in the genus Agaricus and the family Entelomataceae. <laughs> so, and one other thing, I met Christian at one of the previous summer camps and he is always fully in tune on his uh, laptop doing tons of research day and night. So I'm looking forward to this. And I'm sure that was me. <laughs> <laughs> At least on the yeah. There's it, cheese in some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> With a little bit of cheese, yeah. Um, he was so, on his laptop and then I've been researching. <laughs> I'm sure there was some good work being done. So, with that, please welcome Christian Stewart. Howdy, everyone. Um, thanks to David for introducing me. If we get yeah, the lights in a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. Is that good for everyone? No one gets claustrophobic in the dark? So um, I don't know if uh, that came through, but I live in Santa Cruz now. I've lived in Santa Cruz for a little over, um, I guess I'm going into my seventh year now. <clears throat> I'm not even sure I want to admit that anymore. Um, but yes, I am from Santa Cruz. I'm with the Fungus Federation of Santa Cruz. If any of you haven't been to the fungus fair they have there every January, you really ought to go. It's the best event mushroom was in California. Um, maybe I can't Aww. say that here. This is how we did it. All right, never mind. Um, just come through Santa Cruz at your own leisure. Um, tonight, I'll be talking about tales from the cryptogam. So how many of you know what the term cryptogam means? What does it mean? And what did it apply to? It means hidden or gentle. I feel that way myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so cryptogams refers to these lichen. yeah, mosses, lichens, liverworts, fungi, things that didn't have obvious flowering structures like plants. Um, so a lot of these things were considered to be plants. Some of them are still considered to be plants. Um, but now we know that things like lichens are fungi and algae living together in symbiosis, and uh, fungi are their own deal completely. They're not plants. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I will be your guide tonight. Rolf Singer will make a brief appearance. Radioactive boar actually won't make an appearance. I took that slide out, but um, we can talk about it if you want. Um, but we'll be covering sex, murder, and insanity. And if there's any children in the audience, I didn't notice any, um, or any people who are feeling particularly in touch with their inner children tonight, um, I will warn you now that there is material of a prurient nature um, in this presentation. Uh, and if imagining fungal sex or human sex makes you uncomfortable, well, you should probably stay anyways, and just see if you can deal. Um, but I will be talking about that. So, fungi, to begin with, are a strange kingdom of life. Does everyone know what a kingdom of life is? So this is a division of the tree of life at large, equivalent to what plants or animals are. Um, a very large group of organisms that are well differentiated from other eukaryotes. So like sunflowers or you and I. Um, but it is a very diverse kingdom. Um, Fungi range from the things we're really familiar with, mushrooms, to things that we're gratefully familiar with, like morels, to things that we're not really familiar with at all, like the Dithidiomyces. Anyone heard of those before? They're not good on toast. Um, the Pichiniomyces, some of you who are in tune with the agricultural world have known about the rusts. So all of these are varyingly familiar to us or radically unfamiliar to us. But you'll notice that there's this huge chunk of the slice of pie that is the Ascomycota. So that is most of the fungal kingdom. The Ascomycetes dominate the diversity of the, of the fungal tree of life. 
So the city of Mises have a respectable portion, um, but there's all these peripheral groups, these satellite groups that we really don't know much about at all. But one interesting thing about those is that they're almost all predominantly microscopic. They don't produce really large fruit bodies. So it's probably the case that many of these are more diverse than it looks like in this pie chart, but because they're so difficult for us to detect, we've only just started finding out how diverse they are. Um, for example, the uh, Neocalamastica mycota and the Glomerum mycota were only discovered in the last couple decades. So we haven't known about them for very long, and it's likely that their numbers will grow as we study them more. Um, so here's the breakdown of the number of species, and basically that's, you know, we only know about 20 species of these yet, but you really have to sample puddles all over the world um, to find out how many Neocalamastigomyces there are. And needless to say, that's not really getting much government funding anywhere. Um, anyone notice anything missing? Something I certainly learned in AP Bio in high school that's not on this. Zygomyces. Yeah, where's the Zygomyces? Well, it turns out that's a very artificial phylum. It was basically being used as a waste bin for things that we now place in the Mucoromycotina, the Kixolomyces, Zoopagomycotina, I don't ask me what that is, and things like the Entomophoralian fungi, which are things that uh, parasitize insects. And actually, so do the Kixolomyces and the Mucoromyces to some degree. Um, but there isn't really a zygomycota in the way that we used to think about it. They've been transferred elsewhere. So even though we're dealing with this enormous tree of life, tonight we're only going to be focusing on a few of the members of this uh, group of organisms. Primarily the odd, the dark, and the disturbing. <laughs> um, and if that leads you anywhere, it leads you first to sex. Um, and the first organism we'll be talking about is Aclea. Anyone heard of the fungus Aclea before? Me neither. Aclea is one a very primitive species of fungus. It's waterborne, so it lives in puddles, like the uh, Neocalamastigomyces. Um, and basically in rainwater, places that you would never go looking for a fungus. But it's one of the motile swimming fungi. And Aclea has a sort of a bizarre system of reproduction. A really bizarre system, at least from a human perspective. And it introduces us to the idea of inducible genitalia. So what exactly does that mean? <laughs> well, Aclea, the different sexes, exude different hormones, anthridiol and oogoniol, which are sterols, which is the same kind of compound that human sex hormones are, so testosterone um, is a sterol. But basically, these are different forms of sterol that are exuded by these aclea organisms, the different sexes. So anthridiol induces the anther to be formed, and the oogoniol induces the oogonium to be formed. So these hormones that are sort of leaking out of these organisms into the watery environments in which they live induce the formation of genitalia in other individuals. Um, not only that, they also serve as chemotactic targets. So these not only have sort of a physiological result, they act as a signal along which um, these individuals move. So they will follow a trail of oogonial or anthridiol through the water column and look for the other individual that's exuding that hormone. So, once they find each other, they undergo karyogamy, by which you know they <laughs> diddle each other with fertilization tubes and exchange <laughs> genetic information. What does this all look like? Well, here's the oogonium, this big female, quote unquote, egg-shaped, round cell. And here's the anthridial hyphae on either side. And what's happening is that they're exchanging genetic information um, one to the other through these oogonium stalks and anthridial hyphae. Actually, it's just coming through here. This is just the stalk that supports the oogonium. Uh, and then the oospores inside will be what mature and become um, new individuals of Aclea. So, one thing that I'm going to do throughout the course of the talk tonight is ask you to make this concrete for yourselves by imagining what this would look like in human terms. Um, so exactly, human terms. Imagination time. Uh, and I'll do the first one for you. Um, so, so let's all imagine that we're acting like Aclea. Maybe not tonight, because that would just be a little bit too personal. I just messed with some of you. Um, but let's just imagine for now that we're at a party. 
Um, you can go back to the college days or forward to college days, depending on how old you are. Um, you're at a party, and you're standing in the back corner of the room, and you are a sexless individual at this point. You have no genitalia. Um, but you have some sort of genetically determined genitalia, and you're just waiting to be induced. And someone walks into the party. They just got there, and boy, are they stone foxes. And you just get all riled up. They're secreting hormone through the air of this party, and suddenly, Mazel Tov, you've got <laughs> things in So that is how it would look if you were the way Aklia is. Um, and that's just one example of how strange fungi are. And these are some of the most primitive fungi. It only gets more complicated the more derived you go in the tree of fungal life. Um, another one that's not much more advanced, not much more derived, is Allomyces. It's also an aqueous fungus. It, it swims, it lives in the water, and that's actually part of the reason that these two fungi have such unique sexual life cycles, is that when you're in the water, you tend to be fairly far apart from your nearest neighbor. Um, there's a lot of drift, there's a lot of currents that you say maybe as a small you know, microscopic fungus can't really resist. Um, you're planktonic, basically, and you need some help to find your partner. Um, so it's not only a very chemical world, because lots of chemicals disperse quickly in water, um, sometimes more quickly than air, um, or at least more homogeneously, but you're also separated from your neighbors. So uh, these two examples are from aquatic fungi for those reasons. Um, they undergo what's called aqueous planogametic sex, which basically just means they move around while they're having sex. Um, Motel copulation, exciting mission point. Um, male gametes find their female counterparts by homing in on a different hormone, a different signal, that is not called uogonial antiradiol. It doesn't induce the production of genitalia, but what it does is it's still chemotactic, and very strongly chemotactic. Um, it makes male gametes hone in on the female gamete. Um, not the individual, as we saw in the last example, but the actual gamete. Once, once the gamete is produced, um, it itself swims towards the female gamete. And the hormone that it looks for is called serenity. <laughs> now, how many of you are familiar with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, so basically what happened here is the researcher who was studying Alamyces spent way too much time in the library, got all frazzled, um, became very caught up in his work and decided that he would name this after the siren that tempted um, Odysseus. Hercules? Was this Hercules? Pretty sure it's Odysseus. <laughs> Could be Hercules. Um, so, an interesting thing about this chemotaxis is that it's not a straight V line. The male gametes don't just pick up the signal and move. What they do is they make these sort of loops, um, and they follow the strength uh, of the signal with an increase in speed of movement. So what it ends up looking like is, here's the female gamete secreting serenin, and the male gamete follows this spiral path until it finds the female gamete. And uh, Thea knows New. Some of you probably met New um, at UC Berkeley, but he's got videos of this on YouTube. They are not in the top ten YouTube videos, <laughs> um, but you can find videos of gametes finding each other in this way um, because New has found them many times. The weird thing he told me about Alamyces is that you can basically isolate it from any puddle by just boiling a sesame seed and putting it in a test tube with puddle water and then taking the sesame seed out a week later and it'll be covered in Alamyces. Why that works, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Are these only freshwater organisms? Or these are both freshwater organisms. Not yeah. Marine? Yeah. Okay. Not marine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Alamyces humanized. Um, <laughs> so imagine we all lived permanently in an aqueous environment like these fine people. Um, fairly permanent. Um, but imagine that maybe we're not quite so dense as this, that our gametes really needed help finding each other. Half the people were producing one of these things, half the people were producing the other. But in a giant, imagine there's all of us in this room in Lake Superior. We would not have very good chances of our gametes meeting, unless we had an intermediary like Sirenin to help our gametes find each other at the first sight. OK, now we're moving into fungi that are a little bit more familiar, hopefully a lot more familiar, um, because the other ones weren't to us. How many of you have found the split meal before, Chrysophilum communis? It's in your Mycena news right now. Elsa just read a, an article. Elsa Bolinga just wrote an article for you guys about Uh How many of you have found the little rabbit's foot in ECAP, Copernopsis scenario or Lagopus? Yeah, pretty common in dung. It's a really common laboratory organism for reasons that were about to be clear. 
But these are the first fungi that were recognized to be heterothallic, as far as their sexuality goes. And what that means is the different sexes reside in different individuals. In other words, the individuals are not bisexual. John Raper, who studied these two organisms and actually is the person responsible for much of what we know, much of the foundation of what we know about uh, fungal sexuality, said that sexuality in the higher fungi is no more mystifying than elsewhere. The facts examined in proper sequence are simple enough, but there do seem to be quite a few of them. <laughs> so we'll start with Sixopolis. This is a really common fungus on dead and decaying bay laurel, live oak, pretty much anything. Um, it's around the world. If you do a search on Mushroom Observer, some of you probably use that website, you'll find that there's observations from all six continents outside of Antarctica. Um, so this is an extremely successful cosmopolitan, globally distributed organism. Um, there's lots of reasons that Sixopolum is interesting. It's one of the few fungi that's been found growing inside people, um, brooding inside people. They were immune compromised, but that's beside the point. We're not gonna talk about how creepy Sixopolum is. Um, or the fact that people actually eat it uh, on purpose, um, which you can read more about in Elsa's article. We're going to be talking about the sex life of Schizophilum. Um, so why is Schizophilum so successful? How has it made it around the world? How is it so common basically everywhere that it grows? Well, the mating types of individual Schizophilum organisms are controlled by two mating genes, but each of those genes has many different alleles. So I know this is getting a little wonky in terms of genetics, but genes have different forms, and those forms are called alleles. And they do different things from each other, even though they code for the same types of outcomes, same types of protein. Um, they have alpha and beta genes that determine their sexuality, and the alpha A gene has nine alleles. The A beta gene has 32 alleles. The B alpha gene has nine alleles, and the B beta gene has nine alleles. So how many total combinations do we get here? Lots. Many. Yeah. All you have to do is be different in one aspect to be compatible, to be able to mate with one another in this system. So when you have the total outcome being 23,328 unique mating types, there's a lot of mating types that are compatible with one another. Now let's think about this in human terms. In Schizophilum, their mating system prevents them from mating between siblings, because all the siblings will have the same mating type, barring irregular, uncommon recombination events. So they can't mate with their sibling, which prevents inbreeding. <coughs> it increases their potential for outbreeding. And it also means that almost anyone they meet, Schizophilum-wise, they can mate with. Compare that to humans. We can't mate with 50% or so of the people that we meet even under the best case scenario. And we can mate with opposite sex siblings, which increases inbreeding, which on an evolutionary perspective is not a good thing. So does this mean that we are dumber than fungus? <laughs> Some people think so. While I was researching this, I found two editorial posts suggesting that only two of the 2000 or 23,328 mating types should be legally allowed to marry. Um, <laughs> um, which is why I think that we should all vote schizo in 2016. <laughs> okay, so this next part gets really weird. Stink horns. Know them, love them, avoid them, smell them, breathe deeply of their vapors. Okay, so there is a Russian journal of little repute. Um, it is owned by someone who owns a pharmaceutical company. And he also owns a scientific, quote unquote, scientific publication, um, in which he published the results of his investigation into the effects of a stink horn called Phallus multicolor, or Dictyophora multicolor, which isn't this one, but it's a similar one, um, that he had heard legends about. There are these Polynesians leg Polynesian legends about a so-called woman fungus. Um, and it was known to be a netted stink horn of some sort, and it grew on these Polynesian islands, and there would be sort of clandestine groups of women who would seek it out uh, in the bamboo fields, and who knows what, but it was the woman's mushroom thereafter. 
Um, so he did research, quote unquote, research on this uh, that was published in his journal in which he took specimens of Dictyophora multicolor, Phallus multicolor, and exposed it to 10 people, 10 men and 10 women. Um, the men, uniformly, one through 10, found that it smelled awful, just like most of our experience with it. Uh, and out of the 10 women, six of them experienced spontaneous orgasm. Um, so clearly there is some sort of benefit um, to, to having results like this if you're a person who owns a pharmaceutical company. Um, I have not been able to find the full article, no one I know has been able to find the full article, and no one really knows anything about the publication in which it appeared. But the fact that it's owned by a guy in Russia with a pharmaceutical company casts some doubt, um, some aspersion on the quality of this research. Plus, I don't know anyone who's had this experience with any of our local stakeholders. <laughs> you think it would have happened. But if you do, let me know, because <laughs> clearly there's a market for it. I had that in my um, office for 10 days. And? and? No orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people telling me, like, what did you leave in your trash? Rather the <laughs> opposite. Yeah, yeah. But, is this John Holliday, or is it somebody else? You know, I don't know his name, but I'm almost sure that it wasn't John Holliday. Is this, is that someone else who's done this? John Holliday uh, owns Aloha Medicinal, which is a uh, you know, sort of new pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, the first thing that I wrote in there is what uncontacted tribes are there on Hawaii? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> How did he know? Right. I got to see John Harris speak at, at ELMS uh -huh. many years ago. This was one of my first questions for him. And I basically just want to go, what is this? First of all, who publishes an article that's like a paragraph one? Yeah. And then who puts whatever little or large reputation? <laughs> to such an extent that they uncontacted have blind women. The thing is, there's so much at stake. <laughs> 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 if it works, you're famous forever. <laughs> he said he wouldn't trust them to hold the door for him. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a big insult. <laughs> Don also never saw this until about seven years ago on the Hawaiian Islands. Okay. So he's unlikely to have historical use. Yeah, there. he thinks yeah. they came from Brazil. Uh, so maybe ask him to visit. Where there actually are uncontacted yeah. tribes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's move on from smut to smut. Um, <laughs> so the rust and smuts, the funny thing about these is even though they're really small fruiting bodies um, and mostly unnoticed by the average observer, they are in the same group, the Bacinomyces, as the mushrooms that we're all familiar with, um, that are the most familiar source of fungi to us. Um, they just have a really different fruiting morphology and pretty different life cycle. Um, so they are Basidiomyces, but they come in two flavors, heteroecious and autoecious. Heteroecious uh, rust and smuts are things that can complete their life cycle on one plant host. So they all need a plant host of some sort. They are parasitic. Um, but some of them can do it with a single host, and some of them can do it, only can do it if they have two hosts. So how many of you know about um, the juniper apple rust in, in the east? Yeah, so that's on juniper trees for part of its life cycle, and apple or other rosaceous uh, it's yeah, it's is it a different species or is it? Um, um, I'm not sure. It's just on insects here. Yeah, yeah. Here. So I, I think this one is actually that one, but that one's um, what is it? Something with those fedri. I forget the genus, but Calicetris. Well, it, the name. time it was named Calicetris was Libocedrus, so it got the name Libocedri. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. So in any case, whatever it is. And isn't the intermediate host of uh, uh, Amalokia, I think? Yeah. 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 Anything rosacea. Anything rosacea, yeah. yeah. So in any case, these things have complicated life cycles, and they're parasitic. Um, so they are really uh, commercially important to, oops. <laughs> I'm a little hung up. Um, so they're really commercially important to people who grow things like uh, any of the grass family, um, they get rusted and smutted. Um, <coughs> you all know about corn smut, East Largo. It's a little different from these. Um, but they are damaging to commercially important crops every year to the tune of you know, many millions of dollars. So it's really important to know how to manage them if you're a farmer. 
Um, that said, you really have to understand taxonomy to know how to man manage them. Um, identifying which species you've got will tell you, will let you uh, research in the appropriate way how many of these different types of spores it produces. So some rusts produce one or two of these kinds of spores, some produce three or four, some produce all five. The reason they have so many different spores is because of the complexities of their life cycle. Um, and if you don't know which species you're dealing with and what kinds of spores it produces, you're not going to know about its population dynamics, how it moves from one host to another, what uh, point in its life cycle to apply fungicide, for example, um, to interrupt it most effectively to save your crop. So this is a case in which taxonomy really does matter. Um, yeah, not all the rusts produce all the spore types, and that's why taxonomy is important. Um, and if you are in the world of fungal taxonomy, you know that the real money is in um, crop mycology. Um, yeah, and commercial mycology. Um, so I'd like to introduce you, in particular, to one rust. Uh, and I think Theo was there when I took this picture. Um, yeah, so Elsa Bolinga was um, the only reason I saw this. I didn't see it, basically. I walked by it. But Elsa was out with us near Mount Shasta. I guess we were in the Modoc at that point. Um, but she said, come look at this rust. And I was like, I don't really like rust. I'm not interested. But sure, Elsa's telling me to look at it. So I'll look at it. Um, and it's on this little mustard family plant called Erebus. Um, it's in the genus Erebus. And she said, you can't just look at it, though. You have to get down on the ground. So we're all like four of us laying down on the ground, like around this little yellowish plant. And she goes, look. And I was like, what? It's just a yellow little mustard plant. Going on. But all of this yellow is fungal fruiting. That's all rust. And it's overtaking the Erebus that it's growing on. It's coming out of its leaves and completely encoding <coughs> the top few uh, leaves. And it's secreting this sort of sticky, sweet, very strong smelling substance. And what it's doing is it's not just fruiting out of these leaves, it's making what's called a fungal pseudo flower. So it's pretending to be a flower by taking over the host tissue and co-opting it, changing its morphology to produce sugary, sticky secretions and a strong smell that attracts pollinators. So what happens is these bees and serpids and flies think that they're coming to a normal flower because it's got the strong smell of the flower and they're even getting a nectar reward from it, even though it's fake, fungally produced nectar. Um, and what they're doing is they're getting completely coated in the spores from the fungus rather than the pollen from the flower. So this is an extremely sophisticated example of mimicry. And it's not just mimicry, it's actually using the host's body against it. Um, so these Erebus will never flower. They're dead end. They're not going to reproduce. Instead, they have become tools in the surface. Zombies. Of the, yeah, they're zombies, basically. So this is Puccinia minoica. Did you taste it? Um, I actually did. And what does it taste like? It's real sweet. Tastes like honey. I so, mean, so a plant produces the sugar? Well, yeah. So the fungus is causing the plant's physiology to change such that it takes the sugars from the plant and exudes them in a way that the plant never would have. Breaking into the flow of the base. Right. Yeah. Besides being sweet, what flavor does it have? Um, you know, I'm, I'm not that sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> I have only sampled one Puccinia. <laughs> Not to be confused with the opera writer. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> there will be outrage in the streets. Um, okay, so Puccinia minoica transforms its host morphology to produce fungal pseudoflowers, and it not only produces visual cues, so this bright yellow color, but also olfactory cues and chemical cues, the reward of the sugar sweetness. So this is a very strong system for pollinators. They're not just being fooled, they're actually getting what they came for which means that this is a robust system. It's probably going to persist. There's no reason for this to go away other than the plant is the only actor in this who is being harmed. But the plant has very little choice. You know? It doesn't infect the entire crop of areas. We did see normal, unafflicted individuals nearby. So it doesn't kill all of its host population. It's not like a disease in the normal sense that we think of a plant disease. Um, it maintains itself at some sort of um, functional low level within the population so that this evolutionary system can continue. We have it at the field campus. Um, turns, it looks like it's expanding its range. It's interesting. I don't think people noticed it until about 10 years ago. 
The funny thing about that is the Rocky Mountain Field Campus, their botany school, also had it, and they found that it was collected as a flower by oh. the undergraduates pre med <laughs> <laughs> So they went through their plant specimens and they were like, this is a pseudoflower, this is Puccinia. But their undergraduates were totally fooled, just like the bees. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you really can't trust them, probably, and you can throw them. Is it um, specific to, uh, how specific is, is it for oak? They're extremely specific. Um, there are other ones that do similar things, but they're usually one to one or one to a couple. Um, they're not. So it doesn't get on other Christopher plants? I think there are other Puccini that do similar uh, things that are on other Christopher plants. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so. Imagination. <laughs> I could not come up with one for this. <laughs> I've asked every group that I give this talk to to help me imagine what this would look like. And it's either too bizarre and morbid or just too untenable to think about. Um, so if you come up with one by the time this talk is over, let me know. Don't worry, we'll do more imagination. So now we're going to be talking about Dracula orchids. So Dracula is a genus of about 100 neotropical orchids that produce these amazing, how many of you are familiar with the overall morphology of an orchid flower? So what is the landing site called? The lip. The labellum, yeah, the lip. And what it basically is, is like I said, a landing pad for pollinators to land on and access the column, um, where the pollen and the stigma are in an orchid. So these Dracula orchids, which grow as epiphytes in neotropical rainforests, have these really intricate labella that look, to you and I anyways, people who have a framework for understanding it, like little mushrooms. And the researchers who first noticed this noticed that there was mushrooms in the area that looked really similar. So these are little marasmoid fungi, and when you compare them side by side, it's difficult to imagine that there's not mimicry involved going on here. So what we just saw with Puccinia was a fungus overtaking its host morphology and mimicking the flower. And here, even though there's no overtaking of host morphology going on, we have a plant doing the opposite, mimicking the fungus. And why is it doing this? It's attracting these little gnats, these midges and things, that are normally going to lay their eggs in marasmioid mushrooms, um, and instead they're co-opting them as pollinators. So they come to lay their eggs in what they think is a mushroom, and what they get instead is a face full of pollen. If that wasn't enough to convince say that again. Do they still lay their eggs there? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I doubt it. And even if they do, I doubt that they would make it because they're totally different as food. Um, but in any case, if this wasn't enough to convince people, who will say, like, well, this is just coincidence. You know, this is just the morphology of the labellum. You know, developing more surface area, maybe that's somehow useful to the pollinator. Or like, you know, it helps the pollinator more efficiently do its job, um, at least from the plant's perspective. But what they found was that not only are they shaped and colored like the fungi with which they coexist in these habitats, they smell like them. Mm. They found the same long chain alcohols that the mushrooms produce. So they smell to a pollinator, presumably, very similar to how the mushrooms do. So they're producing not only physical cues that guide them visually, but chemical cues. Um, and that's something that I always like to remind myself and other people to think about with fungi is that they live in a much more chemical world than we do. Um, they're sensitive to soil chemistry, they're sensitive to the chemistry of the trees around them, the plants around them, the insects around them. Um, it's, and the insects especially are also chemical groups. They're very attuned to those sorts of gradients. What do Dracula species do? I don't know. I think many of the Dracula species yeah. produce labella like this. Uh, yeah. Grand Santa teacher of uh, Abby and Stephen Sam's environment. Yeah, some of those photos were Britain's photos. Yeah. In his paper, online, it's free. Yep. I'm thinking of the crime game right now. The crime game? Crying. Oh, the crying game. Sorry. I can't say it's familiar. Right. Imagination. In the library with a lead pipe? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on to death. <laughs> um, we're going to start with the lesser deaths. Easy way to do this. So, first, the word tinea. It's a really good Scrabble word. Um, but tinea just means a sort of superficial mycosis, a superficial fungal infection. Um, not deadly. The lesser death. We're going to start with Black Piedra. Has anyone heard of Black Piedra? I had never heard of this. Um, so it's caused by a fungus called Piedria horti. 
I'm gonna ask for my seat, this is at Larry H's. I saw these pictures, it didn't really strike me as much, I didn't freak out, and then I found out what black tetra was. It is a disease of the hair shaft characterized by brownish black nodules on scalp hair, the ascostroma of the fungus. Now how many of you know Zalaria hypoxylon or annular hypoxylon? Now let's go back and look at what that is. This is a piece of hair from someone's head. And here is basically a Zylaria erupting out of it. And suddenly this becomes much more visceral to me. This is really <laughs> gross. Um, so Piedraya horte is called Black Pedra. It's most commonly in South America, although it is globally distributed. It's most common in men who use pomade. <laughs> and many infections are asymptomatic for years. People don't realize they have it. It's not that heavy. But they find that hair is flaking off and breaking, and they're just getting a lot of broken hair. And then they'll go look, and each piece of hair in the scalp has this little ascostrum protruding out of the bottom of it. Um, which basically <coughs> means that you shave your head, apply some fungicide, and move on with your life, and don't use the mold anymore. Um, but you can also find black pedra by isolating it out of the soil with a piece of degreased hair. Um, why that's true, I don't know. The fact that we know it just proves how strange humans are. <laughs> um, someone figured out you could degrease some hair, be, put it in the dirt. Could this be a way of having a, a naturally occurring hair cut all the time? Yeah. You trained it to grow at a certain level. That Is that your secret <laughs> 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 I think it's more at the base than at the tip. Um, but an extreme case of black pedra does not. <laughs> Don't let this happen to you. Say no to pomade. Okay, has everyone had at least an hour or two since dinner? Okay, I'll just, I'll just leave it up on screen for a second. But oral thrush is caused by candida albicans, which also causes yeast infections, of, you know, the vaginal yeast infections. But candida, despite being a really annoying organism most of the time, um, is a really interesting organism from an evolutionary perspective. So it produces white cells that are round, they bud in the classic yeast shape, and they cause skin infections. Um, that's the kind that's most familiar to humans. But they also randomly and rarely produce opaque, elongated, really highly sculptured, ornamented cells that are blood infected. And they're really separate in morphology, and they're really separate in ecology, in that they occur in different places in human bodies. Um, but they give rise to one another, like I said, randomly and rarely. So it's, this is by far the most common kind, but occasionally, when it buds, it won't produce a round cell. It'll produce one of these opaque, highly sculptured cells. What go is back, it? Go back to the middle. No. We don't have a quorum on that. Okay. <laughs> what this is, is epigenetic phenotype switching, which is a mouthful, but what it really means is epigenetic. It doesn't actually involve any change because these are clonal organisms. They're asexually reproducing. Phenotype, meaning the observable outside expression of the body of the organism changes. And they're switching. They're just randomly changing. What, why is this? Does anyone know? Anyone have a guess? Part of it is that they're clonal organs. Start there. Environmental change? Yeah, they have to deal with environmental change. And since they're clonal organisms, they can't rely on sexual variation or sexually generated variation like a sexual organism can. So what they have to do is they have to force it to occur by having this built-in epigenetic phenotype switch that basically just runs on a random clock you know, it throws the dice, so to speak, every time it divides, and occasionally, very rarely, it'll force itself to take on a very different ecology and different shape, hmm. in case it's in the presence of a different and less common environment, uh, just to make sure that it can persist, so that it, uh, the generations can go on. Um, so, let's imagine this. Variation in the environment. So, for Canada, that's mostly, most of the time, it's in the presence of human skin. And occasionally, through a break in the skin, it gets access to the bloodstream, in which case it wants to be able to make it, and hopefully it has divided into one of its opaque sculptured blood infective forms. So in humans, let's say this is global climate over our history. We've experienced ice ages and warm spells, ice ages and warm spells. 
and we rely on sexual variation, family variation in our genetic recombinants, um, to provide sort of a baseline for the environment to select a new form of our descendants to go on. Um, but let's imagine we're in a warm spell, and then we go to an ice age. We have these little tree-adapted, high surface area arboreal humans, or humanoids, that, that basically, imagine we were clonal, we give rise to another arboreal high surface area, warm tolerant individual, but occasionally we hit an ice age. That's like Canada hitting the bloodstream, and it wants to make sure that it can survive and continue to produce. So that would be like us occasionally producing some mammoth, lower surface area, land dwelling, ice age tolerant human, and then going back to an arboreal high surface area, heat dwelling human. Um, does that make sense to everybody? So we can rely on the fact that we generate variation by sexual recombinants, but Canada can't do that. It's bound by the fact that it's an asexual organism, and it has to force itself to change, just to get the environment to change. Yeah? So is there, there's only two states for this, or are there multiple? I think there's only two for Canada. So, so this is only acting as, as an epigenetic trigger on one spot, methylating or something like that? Yeah, I, I don't know if, it'd be interesting to know if it was triggered by environmental change, but I think it's random. I don't think it is. It, it would sort of make sense if, if this happened in a bunch of places so that you generate more, rather than just one, maybe there's only two successful states. Mm -hmm. It seems like there'd be a bunch of <coughs> successful states. But yeah, I don't know enough things. about, actually I know exactly enough about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, so in humans, that's how it would look. It's very hard to imagine because we are sexual and this, we're not sort of, it doesn't really make sense for us to think about it this way. But that was my best job. <laughs> okay, so, fungal meningitis. This is not one of the lesser deaths. This is a pretty serious case. So everyone remembers what happened last year? Fungal meningitis outbreak in the compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts? Um, I actually just saw a compounding pharmacy down the street here. I was unaware that they are still legal after this. Um, but that's part of what I'm going to talk about. So basically what happened is a compounding pharmacy, so everyone knows what that is? Yeah. It's a pharmacy that mixes special ratios of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals for people with you know, whatever their particular condition is in, uh, yeah, in ratios that aren't commercially available. So this compounding pharmacy in Massachusetts produced some tainted steroids that were basically injected directly into people's spinal cords, which is the worst possible place to be injecting tainted steroids. Um, and what these people ended up being infected with is extra hilum in 10 cases and aspergillus in one case, but basically this compounding pharmacy was really messing up. They were not keeping their steroids sterile. Um, and what happened is that, you know, I forget what the final toll was, but many tens of people died from lung meningitis. Um, and what it caused was pretty immediate social and political change. Compounding pharmacies suddenly were subject to all these new federal and local rules on what they could sell, how they could produce what they sold. Um, and it's just an example of the ways in which fungi can change the human landscape, politically and socially, really quickly. Um, and this is not a rare thing. This has happened throughout our histories. Um, fungi and humans are very closely tied to each other's fates. Okay, ghoul fungi. This is post-death. <laughs> so, does anyone know what the word taphonomy means? comes from two roots, taphos and nomos, the laws of burial. So there are people who are professional taphonomists, and if I had the stomach for it, I would do it, because it's fascinating stuff. But you basically have to do things like put a pig in a cave and visit it every three days for a couple of years, um, and that's just not my idea of a good time. I much prefer to sit, you know, in the muddy forest photographing tiny horizons all day. <laughs> you should read Skip. Yeah, no, I didn't. By Mary Roach. Nope. It's about the curious history of the cadaver. Very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um. Speaking of cadavers, <laughs> um, so some people think that if you understand the way that bodies generally decompose well enough, you can solve crimes because you can tell when they've decomposed abnormally, or you can tell how long it's been since the body's died. Um, some people think that fungi play a very important role in being a good taphonomist, um, and in general. I think that's probably not the case. <laughs> you don't solve a lot of crimes by knowing when key take over a carcass. 
but occasionally I guess you do. Um, so cadavers and urea and ammonia are places in which we find these ghoul fungi. And one case that I'd like to profile in particular is uh, this case where in Australia, they were finding this hebloma near marsupial carcasses and near places that were near roads behind trees. Uh, urea and ammonia. Yeah. So carcasses produce urea and ammonia, these nitrogen-rich compounds, as they decompose. But trees near roads also get a lot of urea. Does that make sense to people? <laughs> so these were experimentally treated with urea. Basically, people were going off the road to take a leak behind these trees and excreting a lot of urea into the soil. And what they'd get is these hebolomas that normally fruit out of like wallaby carcasses coming up with the urea that they just enriched the soil with. So I would love to see a carcass associated, associated hebloma. There's a number of them, Amenophilum and Sarcophilum, are two species of hebloma that fruit with dead and decaying animals. I've never seen either. Um, I would love to. If they've got my priorities wrong. We'll keep you posted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, JC. I can help count on you. Um, OK, anyone recognize this? Yeah, so this is Cystoderma. It's a common um, group of fungi that we have, I think, two or three in California, um, often in moss, often in large groups, really beautiful <coughs> fungus. And what I want you to pay attention to about this photograph um, is this sort of scaly, sort of booted look to the stalk. It's got this partial veil and the sheaths of the stalk. It's a very distinctive looking structure. Not a whole lot of fungi have a partial veil or a lower stalk that looks like that. But these Cystoderma are prey to a sort of Actually, I think it's maybe the most bizarre case of parasitism within the kingdom fungi. Um, they are parasitized by another fungus. It's not a little hypomyces, it's not a little zygomyces, it's not a mold, it's another gilled fungus. And it doesn't just grow on it, it grows into it and through it and out of it. It's squamonita. So, remember that boot? The squamonita, which is this purple gray guy, grew into the mycelium, grew up the stalk, took over the head and fruited at the top of it. So squamonitas parasitize these cystodermas and other things. They also parasitize gallerinas. Um, they parasitize, I think, amanitas in South Africa. But squamonitas are some of the rarest gilled mushrooms in North America. They're extremely rare. Um, I only know, I have only met two people ever who have seen a squamonita in, in person. Um, you got one? Where do you get Squamonita? Wait, was that an eastern one? It was Squamonata. <laughs> okay, okay, you got Amanata. Um, yeah, the western one is even rarer. So, Amanata is the one that you find in the east. What did they grow out of there? Trechelomus? At the time, I didn't know. I, it was the group looked like going back to us. Yeah, I mean, they, I mean, if you were to find this and you didn't know that it was parasitic, you'd think that it just had a scaly, golden lower site. And for a long time, that's what people thought. It wasn't until this guy found a field of cystodermas with two Squamonita in it that he put the case together. Um, and so there's this paper that was published on um, the Rosetta Stone of Squamonita, which did not garner international attention. Um, <laughs> but I would drive many miles and would probably buy a plane ticket to see a Squamonita if I knew that there was one going to be there. Um, if someone found one and put a little Tupperware over it and called me, I would have a flight. Um, so, imagination time. You are out in your garden. What happens? I already have done all of this. Say you're tending your sunflowers. Yeah. You're hanging out with your sunflowers. Uh, yeah. You feel it, like itching or something. Yeah, your yeah maybe you go for a whiff of your sunflower or something. Yeah. <laughs> Get a little pollen in your nose. Go back inside for some lemonade. What happens next? You feel unusual. <laughs> 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 Unwell, maybe. The Texan pets it AC. You go to bed that night, the next morning you have a head cold, you go to read the New York Times, have a cup of coffee, and then you collapse and a sunflower pops out of your neck. <laughs> <laughs> Does that not happen to you guys? <laughs> <laughs> That's how Squamity to work, basically. It's a body snatcher. Yeah. And it's even funnier that it's kind of purple. Flying purple people here. Never mind. Um, but Squamity takes over 
from, we, we actually don't know at what point it invades its host's mycelium. We don't know if it comes in at the mycelial stage. It, it must, because it does it so quickly. It fruits out of the fruit bodies within you know, the week that they're up. Um, but no one's ever really investigated squamonino life cycles beyond the fact that they, yeah. Do you know the etymology of the word? Squamonita? Yeah. yeah, some of them have, so. <coughs> wait, do I? No, I don't think I do. Squamo means scale. So I think one of the first ones was found on Cisnerma, and the scaling is the lowest type gave it the squama. Um, and then it's got white spores. I don't think it has free gills. It doesn't really look like it's a vola, but maybe they thought it was aminitoids. They do sort of look like limacellas. Um, they have some things uniting them with limacella micromorphologically, and limacellas are in the family aminitase. So possibly that's what it is, but I don't know. I don't know the etymology of squama either. Um, but they're really cool fungi. Some of them smell like grape soda or like artificial grape candy. It's mm -hmm. bizarre, but true. Are they Excuse me, Christian. Yeah. Um, so uh, does anyone have a white band with uh, license plate 828? Yeah, it's you. Of course it's Norm. <laughs> <laughs> you got to move it, Norm. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. He's always in trouble. It's <laughs> <laughs> the neurological effects of the black pedra. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Squamonita, don't catch anything like it. Let's hope it doesn't evolve to infect humans anytime soon. Or even when it came late. Um, okay, so it's Hannity. Hannity. These are the real alternative life cycles. This is the really bizarre stuff, as if it hasn't been bizarre enough. Squamonita could easily have gone in this section, but. So, level Benny alien fungi. Anyone spent any time with these guys? Me neither. <laughs> Part of the problem is that they're almost invisible. You never notice them unless you were, well, Roland Baxter. We'll talk about him in a second. Um, they are these little ascomyces that fruit out of the exoskeletons of insects the world over. Um, all sorts of different insects. A lot of beetles. Um, and the funny thing is they don't kill their host. They're not like the cornus Um They just sort of ruin the structural integrity of the chitinous exoskeleton in the place where they grow out of. So these, these little gelatinous sticks, basically, that produce a bunch of two-parted ascospores, and they have some appendages. And they're microscopic, or nearly microscopic. I guess you can see those with the naked eye. Um, so that's the basic structure of the level, beni level beni alien fungus. And they were mostly studied, most of what we know about them from this guy, Roland Baxter. Um, he produced five multiple hundred page works on level beni alien fungi before the internet was around, before microscopy had gotten really good. So this guy spent a lot of time peering down pretty marginal microscopes at dead beetles, looking for things that he then made beautiful drawings of. So Roland Baxter's drawings show all these two-parted ascospores in the fertile part, and then all these appendages. And the funny thing is, I can only ever find them called appendages. Now whenever it says what they do, they're just appendages. Um, but they have all these different morphologies. Um, and they are, does anyone know Meredith Blackwell? The main Meredith mm -hmm. Blackwell? She's really famous, um, studies the interaction of fungi and um, insects. But she knows some about these. There's people who go and through or, or, um, museum specimens of beetles just looking to see if anyone missed any level of any alien fungi on their beetle specimen. Mm -hmm. And they find things like that all the time. They're very diverse. But there's these hyper specific, really tiny niches. Um, some of these things only grow on the left front foot of what kind of, you know, one kind of beetle. Um, so they're things that have really found their niche in the evolutionary scheme of things and exploited. Um, so sometimes there's multiple species on one insect. Okay, slight tangent. Does anyone read Lord of the Rings? J.R.R. Tolkien? Roland Baxter's signature looks exactly like J.R.R. Tolkien. <laughs> I was just looking through his drawings and I was like, what? What is this? I'm a huge Lord of the Rings nerd. So something's going on here. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jared Tolkien was actually a level Bailey, level Benny alien fungi taxonomy expert. Um, and we just never knew about it. That's really what Sauron was into. Um, okay. So microsporidians. These are potentially the only group of fungi more specialized um, than the level Benny alien fungi. So uh, in 21st Century Guidebook to Fungi, they're referred to as some of the most reduced and highly specialized fungi, which is high, high praise. Um, and 
quite a strong statement for a group of organisms that has such specialized life histories. But what the microsporidians are is these very unusual parasitic fungi. They do things like this. And this is a flatfish with a microsporidian infection. It's got a problem. Um, microsporidian fungi are really weird. So what they do is they parasitize various groups of organisms, not just flatfish, um, but they do it in a way such that they don't really kill their host quickly. They're not like a strong, you know, immediately um, mortal infection. They usually have results that are more like long-term reduction in fitness. You have fewer offspring than you would otherwise, or you are generally reduced in vigor or weight or fitness and health in some way. Um, so they really keep their host alive so that they can persist for a long time and reproduce, but they don't really kill their host. So they infect lots of different invertebrates, commercially important fish like the halibut we just saw, humans, disarmingly, and cage birds. Now these are all things that we have pretty close ties to. Cage birds, we see all the time. Commercially important fishes are commercially important. Humans, well, it's us, so we know about them. And invertebrates, there's just so many that at some point we've been investigating them and found them. But I think probably microsporidians are common in a much broader swath of the tree of life, and these are just the groups that we think of the most commonly associated with. Um, but they're, they're very small fungi, um, and they're easy to miss um, if you don't find their large, sort of tumorous uh, growths on their host. So what they tend to have is chronic debilitating effects on their host, and, and some of these are like the main categories in which they do that. But an interesting thing about this is that if you can harness this, there's potential positive uses for microsporidian fungi, although you have to be very careful. So one example is with relation to malaria. So if anyone knows about the malarial life cycle, you know that the mosquito has to reach a certain age for the malarial parasite, the plasmodium, to reach infective stage, to reach its infective um, age. And so if you can get these mosquitoes to not live as long, to not be as healthy for as long, to not be able to fly around and bite people, um, you can prevent the full development of the plasmodium and maybe prevent those mosquitoes from being transmissive of malaria. So the other thing about microsporidians is they're extremely host-specific. So there's a couple of researchers who are thinking about using these microsporidians to control these mosquitoes and shorten their lifespans long enough, or by shorten their lifespans by enough that the plasmodium living inside them would not reach infective malarial stage. Um, and the crazy thing about microsporidians is that they are not really um, transmitted horizontally. They're transmitted in the ovaries of the mosquito to the eggs of that mother. So there is no chance that the eggs will avoid infection by the microsporidium. It's all vertical descent. So it's evolution proof. These mosquitoes will never be able to recombine sexually to the degree that they will be able to resist the microsporidium infection. They will get it as eggs before they're even fertile, which is a very scary thing to think about. Um, one would hope it doesn't happen to humans in a big way. That's a really good question. But basically, you take a culture of the microsporidia and you put um, experimental populations into the wild population. So you would basically intentionally introduce mosquitoes from a bucket that had tons of the microsporidia and fungus in it out into the wild, and then they will transmit it um, to each other through sexual contact, and then all the females that have it will give it to their offspring. So, pretty fascinating. It's a very clever system that has also potentially terrible impacts. Um, so it would have to be implemented very carefully. Okay, so let's talk about ways in which fungi are involved in human culture. There's all the obvious ways. I don't want to talk about fermentation. I want to talk about the weird stuff. So how many of you have smoked a candy cap? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, I have not smoked a candy cap either. However, David Aurora told me that at the end of the day of candy cap harvesting, a lot of commercial Mexican and Vietnamese and Thai pickers will sit down in their hotel room and roll candy caps into their tobacco and smoke it. Dry mm -hmm. candy caps. Yeah. 
I do, why not, right? <laughs> That's how I felt about it. Um, because there's so many cookies you could be making out of it. Um, yeah, I don't think Marlboro is going to pick it up. But who knows. So smoking like Paris. That's one really bizarre, very unknown, um, sort of peripheral way in which humans have interacted in a smoking way with fungi. But Inuits and other Arctic native tribes use Felinus in a sort of similar way. What they do is they take these Felinus fruit bodies and they would burn them to ash and mix it with their chewing tobacco. And what happens with this Felinus ash is that it acts as a chemical potentiator for the nicotine in the tobacco and it absorbs much quicker and has a much stronger effect. Um, so they have these even like special bowls that they made or containers that they made for the ash out of this Felinus, um, which I think is a fascinating idea. It's totally bizarre. It's even, <laughs> it was involved in a court case um, where some guy basically went off his rocker. He was crazy, but the judge, not knowing anything about what a Felinus was, thought that it was in his tobacco as a, as a hallucinatory or somehow like berserker-inducing drug. Um, so they like spent a couple of weeks during the trial quantifying the effects of Felinus and whether or not that was what made him go on a rampage. Turns out it was, um, but his buzz was wrong. Okay, so the indoor jungle. <clears throat> what is the reason that the pictures you are looking at here? I think probably just sheer innovation. Flavor, yeah. It's flavor, and they have a lot of them lying around. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I and a couple other people think that these are type of mushrooms. Candy cats? Yep. Fascinating. <laughs> I've never felt that way myself. I, I can give you some anecdotes later. Okay. <laughs> How much you have to eat? I was told to your. Um, you can eat. You can eat mushrooms and, and have an effect that's not like. Uh, it's different than uh, the experience, and I've had some interesting experiences by uh, having ODing on candy cat honey butter. <laughs> Hard to follow that. Weird <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, the indoor jungle. Fungi are not just out in the forest. Fungi are not just out in your garden. Fungi are inside, they're in the air we're breathing right now, they're in the rafters. Um, there's undoubtedly some structural problems in this building due to fungi. Um, but TripAdvisor, how many of you use that website? Yeah. When you have to plan your travel. <laughs> well, some people use TripAdvisor for a very different, uh -huh. uh, very different purpose. I was sitting in the lunchroom at UC Berkeley um, and found this journal called Indoor Air and found an article in it that started with the sentence, there is little information on the indoor environment in hotels, which is a great way to start almost any piece of writing, um, but especially a scientific piece of writing. What does this even mean? You know, like What they were talking about is from a biological, fungal, community biology perspective, in which case I would have to sympathize with them. Yes, there is little information. But they were out on a crusade to change that. And what they did is they took dust swabs from the door frames of 69 different hotel rooms in 20 countries throughout Europe and Asia. What this sounds like to me is that there's a bunch of researchers going to conferences a lot, spending a lot of time away from home, not being able to do research at home. And so what they did is they just did research in their hotel rooms. Um, <laughs> so they took these door swabs and they sequenced, they did next level or next generation sequencing on these samples. And they found that the TripAdvisor ratings they found online for the hotels they stayed at could be used as predictors for certain characteristics of the fungal communities they're in. Um, they found, unsurprisingly, that seaside location, lack of mechanical ventilation, and dampness were predictors of total amounts of fungal DNA, and the hotel ranking on TripAdvisor, or self-rated quality of the interior of the hotel room, was also a good predictor of total fungal DNA, and that people's reviews of the odor of the hotel room predicted pretty strongly the presence of a single fungus. Struck my nice future. <laughs> so next time you go on TripAdvisor and someone gives it a bad odor rating, think, do I want to be exposed to this? <laughs> it's a pretty good correlation. We can give you the R value later if you want. Um, hotels in tropical areas also unsurprisingly had 10 to 100 times more total DNA, especially with Aspergillus and Pemphilium species than those in temperate zones. Um, but this is really an important area of research. Indoor environments, urban environments, non-natural, whatever that means, environments, human-modified environments, are just as much a habitat as forests are. They behave really differently, they look really different, 
but things are going on in here. Insects are making livings in here. Insects and fungi are interacting within indoor environments. Invasive species are being transferred from hotel to hotel, living space to living space, without any intermediary, non-human modified environment in between. And that's not trivial. It's actually even less trivial because we're in direct contact with it all the time. Um, so I think this is, journals like Indoor Air are maybe really weird right now, but I think they're probably important to pay attention to um, increasingly so. What did this guy find when he saw outside the hotel? I don't know. I don't know if he did that. Um, but if you want to find out, here's the citation. Mm -hmm. Go look at whatever Norbach D and Kai GH found um, in their other publications. I know they actually have done other uh, studies like this, so it's not. This is not the end of the road. Um, they're really going ho about this kind of stuff. Um, so that was my journal <coughs> environmental monitoring. Okay, another way in which fungi have interacted with our society, especially our politics and laws, in a really bizarre way. How many of you know about chloral hydrate and why we need it? Wow, no, you guys are enthusiastic about <laughs> chloral hydrate. I was just playing with it. That kind of makes me nervous. <laughs> um, Chloral hydrate is, well here's the molecular structure of chloral hydrate. It's a component of Melcher's reagent, which is that amber brown liquid that everyone seems kind of feverish about. Um, you know, furtive deals in the back of the room, guy like handing vials out of his coat in front of the shop. Um, in any case, chloral hydrate is a component of Melcher's reagent because it is a visual, it's an optical enhancer. Um, it allows you to use it as a reagent under the microscope without totally obscuring your field of view. So Melcher's reagent has a bunch of other chemicals in it that would produce a very cloudy solution if you didn't use chloral hydrate to clear it up. So it's a really important chemical, for, for, especially for studying Ruscula. Um, there's actually Melanoleuca. There's tons of fungi that show amyloid reactions. Ascomycetes show reactions with Melcher's reagent. And chloral hydrate is an essential component of this microscopic um, tool. But it's a controlled substance. You and I can't get it. We can't just go buy chloral hydrate. And it's like a constant struggle to, to get it if you are someone who wants to study Ruscula and Melanoleuca. Um, of course, that's maybe just the government's way of squashing out Ruscula. <laughs> who wants more of those around? <laughs> this is what Melcher's reagent and the chloral hydrate by default will help you see in Ruscula. These would be sort of pale translucent golden blobs if you didn't have Melcher's reagent. And with Melcher's reagent, you can see all these beautiful decorations on the outside that react this blue-black color in the presence of this chemical. So you really need this if you are going to study these fungi. But the reason we can't get chloral hydrate, does anyone know? Oh yeah, Mickey Finn's knockout drop. It's a little bit, it's a little bit past what my generation is generally familiar with, but I read a lot of old Hardy Boys. Um, <laughs> Mickey Finn's and knockout drops are not totally unknown to me. Um, <laughs> that sounds wrong. Um, anyways, Meltzer's is hard to get a hold of. Why? Because it's a date rate drug. Mickey Finn's and knockout drops are um, made of chloral hydrate, and you can put them into a drink and basically have someone pass out. Um, they are also what Anna Nicole Smith overdosed on. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Russula taxonomy and Anna Nicole Smith. Only one degree of separation apart. <laughs> Bizarre. Okay, another thing that fungi do that is really bizarre, aside from interacting with human cultures, is they do this thing called synchronous fruiting. How many of you have noticed that when your belief patch is going off, your friend's belief patch is also going off? Does that happen? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's pretty normal. You know, things have seasons. But what about more difficult to explain phenomena? Anyone know this mushroom? Okay, the fact that so many of you said the actual, the correct name for this means that I am in the presence of a very qualified crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think any other group I've shown this to has named it. So, yeah, hygroscopy by resins, the lime green wax cap. These are a bit faded, but when they're young, they all start out, you can see the very edge of the cap here is this beautiful lime green color. It's a really quite rare wax cap. It's not one of our most common ones. It's actually one of our rarest ones. Um, David Aurora had seen it once when he published Mushrooms Demystified, and had not seen it since until last year, despite going to look for it again multiple times. Um, it's very rare. I had always wanted to see it, never really expected that I would, because I knew I had very little chance of seeing it. Um, but Noah, how many of you met Noah Siegel? 
and he's probably given talks to this club before. Um, no is sort of a waxy cap buff. He's got a little bit of a fetish. It's a problem for him. Um, <laughs> but he wants to have photographs of every waxy cap, sensu lato, the broadest possible sense of waxy cap, in California and probably the world if you ask him. But he wanted to see this thing really badly. So last year, on Thanksgiving, he called me. He was up at David Aurora's foray in Mendocino County and said, Christian, I got I got through a residence today. And I said, you bastard. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to drive 400 miles and see it this week. I have to work. You know, I can't get up there. Good for you. But damn, that's a bit I'm not going to see it. That's like my one chance to chase it. I'm not going to be able to do it. So to console myself, I went mushroom hunting at Nicene Mark, which is in southern Santa Cruz County, which, as most of you know, is really far away from Mendocino County. And the last mushroom I found that day it was 200 individuals with uh, Hygrosby Bear uh, uh, So the same day, <laughs> When no one has seen Hygrosby or you know, maybe one or two people have seen Hygrosby or since David Aurora found it at Van Damme, Noah and I both find it. More than, you know, four or five hundred and six hundred miles apart. The same day. So I called Noah that night and I said, yeah, no big deal. You know, I'm, not, I'm not super concerned about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is this phenomenon? The rest of that weekend, so in the next three days after the first day, Seven more locations were reported in between our two spots. Totally different observers. All found their grass by rest inside. Mm -hmm. What's going on? It goes, it's absent, or it's so low key that no one sees it. It's a very distinctive mushroom. No one sees it for 40 years, and then in one weekend we get eight new localities. Totally different observers every time. <coughs> this is a phenomenon that's not only reported in the US for things like the grass by essence, but you know, on the East Coast, um, Gary Linkoff and Sam Ristich and um, what's his name? Uh, Walt Sturgeon. Sturgeon would do the same thing for Foliota de, Luca Foliota de Carosa. Sam Ristich would call Gary Linkoff, who would call Walt Sturgeon, in the same weekend from New York to you know the central um, eastern states, would find Luca Foliota de Carosa on the same weekend. How is that possible? Squamanita, that one I talked about earlier in Europe, is well known for doing the same, the synchronized fruit. No one knows exactly how, over so much distance, where really the climatic regime is not the same. You can't explain it by saying the local habitats were all experiencing the same storm system, same barometric pressure. How, how this happened? I've not heard of anyone researching it either, so it's not surprising that we have no clue. But it's really a cool phenomenon that I would love to know more about. But fungi do this and so do humans. So while I was putting this talk together, I put together this funny little slide, and you know, I was so proud of my Photoshop skills and the fact that I had dug up some bizarre graphic novel cover. And then I showed it to Todd Osmondson at UC Berkeley, and he was like, oh, yeah, that's old hat. Um, <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, that's been done. I'm like, what, what do you mean, Tales of Crypto Game has been done? He's like, yeah, I was just, you know, I was in, uh, I think, I was in England last year, and someone did the same thing. I said, who? And he said, Ann Pringle from Harvard. And so I emailed Ann Pringle furiously, like the next minute, and I was like, Ann, did you really do this? And she said, yeah, I'll send you our title slide. And this is what it looked like. <laughs> <laughs> I was so mad. But apparently, I know, one year before, she spoofed me. Simultaneous. Yeah, yeah. Synchronous thinking. So humans do it, fungi do it. It's real weird. It's a little spooky. OK, funnel development. Fungi are weird for another reason. They're very tolerant of developmental imprecision. Now, what does that mean? It means that we can occasionally find things like this. So this bully clearly had some problems in a really cool way. What is this? It's a chanterelle. But it's a chanterelle that got rose combed. It's like this convoluted mass of folds. It's like no chanterelle we've seen before. It almost looks like a hedgehog, which is funny because they're related. But yeah, this is a late Ryan Snow's photo. Um, this is someone who I only know as the Forager 3. Um, <laughs> but fungi can do this. And the funny thing about both of these fruit bodies is that they're evolutionarily fine. They're both still producing lots of spores. They both still have high surface area. Yes, they look a little messed up. Yes, their morphology is atypical. But this has plenty of fertile tubing that's going to produce spores. It has a good chance of reproducing. And this is all fertile surface. It's got no cap. So those are infested with something else? We don't really know why this happens. We don't know. Some of it is probably just genetic. It's just 
inherent. It's not a disease, it's not a virus, it's just a morphological, yeah. It's just, it fails to separate its tubes or from its siphon in the way that bullets normally do, um, or it fails to form a cap. There's a lack of a pileal gene, which is a common mutation in fungi. But the thing is, they're tolerant of this developmental adversity. They can mess up in these big ways and still be relatively evolutionarily fit. So in the 21st century guidebook to fungi, they frame this by saying that they are uh, very tolerant of developmental imprecision and highly polymorphic but functional, which really stuck with me, the idea of highly polymorphic but functional organisms. Now, I'm going to see if I have enough light to read here, but they also say some other cool, beautiful things about fungi that I'd like you to think about, not only from a fungal perspective, but maybe from a human perspective. So they say that the possibility has been discussed that fungal development exhibits what would be described in cybernetic terms as fuzzy logic. This idea suggests that instead of yes-no decisions, fungal development depends on the balance of a network of approximations. Fuzzy logic can, be, uh, can handle the concept of potential truth, or of partial truth, of values between completely true and completely false. It is able to handle uncertainty and vagueness. Decision-making in the human world is also characterized by the need to process incomplete, imprecise, vague, uncertain information, the sort provided by error-prone sensors, inadequate feedback, and excessive noise. Any of you who have been in a work environment in an office know coworkers who are examples of excessive noise, inadequate feedback, and error-prone <laughs> sensing. So I think that fungal development is Yeah, right. The funny thing is they're providing, I think, a metaphor to, at least for us, to imitate you. To be, learn how to be highly polymorphic and how to tolerate developmental precision in our societies and in ourselves and in our relationships. I don't really believe in Paul Stamets' vision of mushrooms saving the world, but I do think they're pretty powerful metaphors for the ways that we structure our own society. So, find your place in the world, no matter how specific it is. If you've been trying something and it's not working, try something else. Let's think together across time and space, make magic happen, and let's all hope to get to the <laughs> um, if there are any questions, you guys can ask them now. And I also have a very few amounts of um, business cards, but these cards on the back have the address of my blog where stuff like this shows up occasionally. A lot of this stuff is material that's appeared on the blog, so you're welcome to take those if you want. Um, any questions?